Это организация комьюнити, направленная на развитие идей работы будущего, организованной организации, колократии. Мы такая группа людей, которые думают о том, как будут выглядеть организации без менеджеров. Мы делаем метапы, делаем партнерство, партнерство с Мерпесом, с Аксоном. Вот. И а, тема такая очень интересная. Я с ней познакомился где-то полгода назад. А, не очень была как бы, очевидная проблема, это как справедливо делить собственность. А, всегда как бы непонятно, всегда хочется, вот, когда есть атмосфера партнерства, когда нет четкого там, менеджмента, вот мы все там, партнеры, коллеги, давайте двигаться вперед. А, совсем непонятно, как справедливо разделить, так что потом не ожидать об этом будущем. Вот. И идея настолько, как бы, идея настолько простая, сложна в реализации, но сам смысл. Настолько меня поразил, что мы начали пробовать это у себя и в организации, и в бизнесе айтишном. И очень классно, если эти идеи кому-то будут тоже цены и будут полезны. Вот. Спасибо большое Аксону. Я думаю, что надо, как бы это все не работает без грамотного внедрения. Все классно на словах, но реально должно быть закреплено, надо не возвращаться за этим. Вот. Ну, передай слово Майку. Hey, Mike, I'm passing the word to you. Uh, Good. Thank you very much for having me today. I really appreciate it. It's wonderful to be able to speak to folks in Ukraine. Um, my name is Mike Moyer, and today we're going to talk about the slicing pie model for equity splits, which is the world's only fair way to split equity. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, that's fine. Um, just turn your audio on and ask me the question, and I'll try to answer it the best I can during the presentation or you can hold your questions till the end. Um, but I'll go ahead and get started. So I teach entrepreneurship at a number of business schools in the United States. And one of the things that I notice is that startups are hard work and I've been an entrepreneur most of my career. And I've noticed that it's really hard to do this, but they're a lot of fun. I hope, and there's a big payout waiting for the future. So we all do this because startups are fun and there's a big payout, we hope. The problem is we don't know what that payout's going to be. The future is always unknowable. We can't predict the future. We can't count on what, uh, what's, what we think is going to happen to actually happen. We can, we can never know what's going to happen in the future. The future is unknowable. But Success usually means that we're going to change the world. We're going to make our product or our service or do something in our business that's going to change the world for the better. We're going to make lots and lots of money, and you're going to get your fair share. If you're getting your fair share of equity and your, your, your fair share of the money as it comes in, the company will be fun. And as long as it's fun, it's fair, it'll be fun to work for. And if startups aren't fun, we can go back to our real jobs and our day jobs that aren't fun and just get paid. But as long as startups are fun, we can stay engaged in the startup. If they stop being fun, they start falling apart. So the fair share should be this. Your share of the company, your percentage of the equity, the ownership of the company, should equal the value of your contribution divided by the total value of the firm. So what you do divided by what the company's worth. Unfortunately, the only way to figure this out is to consider the promises of the participant, the employee or the partner or the investor, who make big promises. And you'll have to divide it by the dreams of the entrepreneur or of the founders. So founders have big dreams. My company is going to be worth a billion dollars someday. Or um, promises are made like, I'm gonna bring in tons of customers or huge investments or build your great software program. So we can't figure this out. There's no way to figure this number out in reality. So we talk to lawyers and advisors and professors and girlfriends and boyfriends and our moms and dads and our rich relatives trying to figure out how much equity is reasonable for someone in a startup company. And those folks will tell us to estimate the future. What are the financial projections? What's the, what's the rule or the, the, the typical CTO get? Or figure out industry standards. No matter what people say with regard to equity splits, most of the advice comes in the form of what's called a fixed equity split. 67% of companies do fixed equity splits. And a fixed equity split is when chunks of equity and percentages are doled out to partners in advance of any work being done. So we'll sit down and we'll say, 
let's go 60 40 because it was your idea so you should get 60 percent and i'll take 40 percent or 51 49 so we can maintain control of the company or some other variation of that a fixed equity split is when you dole out chunks of equity at the advance of something actually happening but people argue about this because 60 40 may not sound fair to someone so they'll say let's just keep it simple and we'll do equal splits 90 percent of companies do equal splits that means they give each person half the company or a third, a third, a third, or a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. They divide 100% by the number of participants and they call it their split. It's extremely common. But what if you do all the work? So we're 50-50 and you do all the work, I own half your company. Or I'm a marketing person and you're a technology person and you wanna hire another marketing person to come in our team. Does his equity share come out of my equity share? or yours or both of ours, he's gonna be helping me, not you, so we have to have a discussion about it. Or what if you wanna quit? Or what if I wanna quit? There's a million things that could go wrong in your company. There's a million things that will change. No matter what you thought was gonna happen in the beginning, is guaranteed to be different going forward. So what you wind up with, with a fixed equity split when something changes, is the first one is called, you have this greater than, you have more than your fair share. More than your fair share means that you're getting more equity than you deserve. Sometimes people want more equity than they deserve. They figure if it's going to be wrong, it might as well be wrong in their favor. The other option is getting less equity than you deserve. So you get the less than sign. Nobody wants less than they deserve. But when you go into a negotiation for a fixed equity split in your company, you're virtually guaranteed to get the wrong amount of equity. You're either going to have more than you deserve or less than you deserve. And knowing that you means you're gonna, you're gonna fight with your, your co-founders. I call these alligator pit negotiations. You have the less than gator, people who are afraid of getting less than they deserve, and the greater than gator, people who wanna get more than they deserve. And the instincts in this kind of situation are protecting yourself, getting as much as you can for yourself, getting out of the negotiation as fast as you possibly can, and you leave there with, with resentment and anger and disappointment usually usually every time and the equity split can never be fair and once people realize it's not fair the company will stop being fun this is the fundamental problem with equity splits today i call it fix and fight we'll split up the equity at the outset and fight about it later and when you fight about it later you wind up with another fixed equity split so your problems just start over and start over and start over and i have personally been involved in a number of companies that have had this exact same problem, and I can't stand it. And a few years ago, after a situation that I was very unhappy with, I sat down and wrote a list of criteria. I wanted to create an equity split that was perfectly fair. I didn't want an equity split that was kind of fair, or sort of felt fair, or seemed fair. I want it to be exactly fair. I want to reward actual contributions people make. People say they're going to do a lot of things. What they actually do is usually quite different. So I want to reward the actual contributions that people make. I want to provide ongoing motivation to continue. Because when you realize your equity split is not fair, your motivation goes down. So we need a program that keeps motivation high. We want to accommodate team changes. People will join our team and people will leave our team. We have to make sure that we handle that properly. We want to be flexible in the face of rapid change. We want to, that means we, when people join the company or leave, we don't want to have to call our attorneys and have them redraft our agreements. We want it to be quick change. And we want to get rid of the alligators. We want to make sure that there's no chance that um, someone's going to take advantage of me or I'm going to take advantage of them. So the answer to this problem is called a dynamic equity split. A dynamic equity split is one that changes over time, it self adjusts to stay fair in response to things that change in your company. So as your company evolves, so will your equity split. And research has shown that dynamic equity splits, teams that use dynamic equity splits, raise more money and higher valuations and more, ultimately more successful and avoid these problems. So what a dynamic equity split will give you, if you contributed 50% of what it took to be successful, you should get 50% of the rewards. If you contributed 23.2% of what it took to be successful, you should get 23.2% of the rewards. You should always get what you deserve, no more and no less. So one way to think about this is a game of blackjack. And blackjack, I don't, I don't know how much they play blackjack in Ukraine, but popular in the United States. 
pretend you and I are going to play blackjack together as a team together, not against each other. And we go to the table and I put my chip on the table and you put your chip on the table. We don't know if we're going to win. We don't know how much we're going to win. We don't know how long it's going to take to win. What we can surely know though, is that we each bet one chip. So the dealer deals. She deals an ace and another ace. Now in blackjack, the idea is to split the aces and double down. So just like in a company, when opportunities present themselves, you want to be able to take advantage of them. So we split the aces and double down our bets, put it say, keep betting. I'm out of money though, and you're not. So you put two more chips down. So now we don't know if we're going to win still. We don't know how much we're going to win or how long it's going to take to win. The future is still completely unknowable. But what we absolutely know for sure is that you bet three chips and I bet one chip. So if we do win, 50-50 isn't fair. It should be 25%, 75%. Your share of the winnings should be based on your share of the bets placed. Startups are exactly the same thing. But instead of betting on cards, we're betting on ideas. And we bet time and money and facilities and supplies and equipment and all kinds of things. And the value of our bet equals the fair market value of the contribution made. So when you acquire a contribution, it requires someone's time or rent or supplies. You always ask yourself, if I was going to pay for this service or this person or this product or this supplies, how much would be logical to pay? That's the fair market value. If you have the cash, you simply pay it. If you don't have the cash, that becomes a bet on the future outcome of the startup in terms of profits or proceeds of sale. And a person's share of the equity should always be based on that person's share of the bets. If you base your equity split on anything else, it's going to be wrong. You should always base it on the share of the bets being placed. What Slicey Pie does, it simply tracks who made what bet and divides up equity accordingly. So in this case, we can see the split based on the chips played on the game. So there are two main points to uh, <clears throat> slicing pie. The first is the allocation framework, which determines the distribution of, of equity. And the second is the recovery framework for getting equity back from people when they leave the company. <clears throat> this animal is called a grunt. You might hear, hear it referred to as a grunt fund. Um, it's a person that works really hard for a startup company. <clears throat> Excuse me. So slicing pie is a universal, <clears throat> a universal one size fits all solution for the allocation and recovery of equity in an early stage bootstrap startup. What that means is the exact same formula works for any company on the entire planet. <clears throat> There are no exceptions, there's no changes, it always works exactly the same. Just like the game of blackjack is the same no matter where you play it in the world, it's always the same. And it's used during a period of inadequate cash when you don't have enough money to cover your expenses. <clears throat> Startup companies fund themselves by not paying people. So it'll hire employees and not pay them, that's how they fund themselves. It doesn't mean the employee is not worth anything, it just means we didn't pay that person. We might have free rent from some office building. It doesn't mean the office isn't worth something. It just means you don't have the cash to pay it, so we don't pay it. And people allow us not to pay it because they want us to succeed. As the company grows and starts generating revenues or investment dollars, we turn to a phase of adequate cash. We have enough cash to pay our bills. If a company has enough company money to pay its bills, it's expected to pay its bills. If you go work for Google, you expect that Google will pay your salary. If you go for work for a startup, you don't expect your salary to be paid. And after the company grows and grows and grows, it generates profits and <clears throat> it might sell and get some proceeds for sale. So slicing pie is for the inadequate cash period, the period of time when you're not able to pay everybody because you don't have enough revenue or you don't have investment dollars. So the first thing is the allocation framework. This will determine how to allocate shares to your participants at the right time. In blackjack, we used poker chips to mark our bets. 
In slicing pie, we use what's called a slice. A slice is a fictional unit of at-risk contribution. It, just like a poker chip, it, 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 it's a marker for the bet that's been placed. Unlike percentages of equity or shares of equity, you can have as many slices in the pie as you need to. They're limitless. So to allocate equity, you convert your contributions into slices. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. All contributions can be converted to slices. At any given time, your share of the equity will be equal to your slices divided by all the slices. Just like in blackjack, it was your chip divided by all the chips that determine your share. And it'll self-adjust over time to stay fair. Now there are two kinds of contributions someone can make to a company. The first kind is a non-cash contribution. Non-cash are things that don't require cash out of pocket. Ideas, time, relationships, facilities, things that don't require cash out of pocket. And there are cash contributions which do require cash out of pocket. Unreimbursed expenses like travel expenses or loans made to the company or cash investments, those require someone to take cash out of their pocket and put it into the company. And some things go in the middle. So for instance, a truck or a piece of equipment or some supplies. If you buy it for the company, that's cash. If you already owned it and you put it into the company, that's non-cash. So if I owned a truck sitting in my backyard, that's a non-cash contribution. If I bought the truck for the company, that's a cash contribution. So you take the fair market value, which is the price that you would pay if you were to buy it. So if I was going to buy your time, how much would I be willing to pay? And if I can pay, I'll pay cash. If I can't pay, I'll pay in slices. And specifically, for every dollar in cash, or, or uh, I can't pronounce your, your currency, Krunia. Krunia? Raise your hand if I said that right. I didn't say it right, did I? Um, I'll just call it dollars for now. So you, for every dollar in cash, you put in, you get two slices. Just like if you win blackjack, where you get a two to one payout. When you put your non-cash into contribution into a company, you get two slices. Now cash is different than non-cash because it has different considerations. For instance, if I paid you cash to work for me, and you work for me for, and you wanted to buy something that cost $100, and I paid you $100 an hour, it would take you more than an hour to earn enough money, because when I paid you, I pay employment taxes. When you receive the money, you pay income taxes, and when you bought the stuff, you pay sales tax or VAT tax. So you may actually have to work two hours to earn enough money to buy that one thing. Additionally, if I put cash into the company, I want managers to think twice before they spend it, so I have to put a higher value on it. So for every dollar in cash I consume in the company, you get four slices. So a dollar in non-cash gets two slices in the pie, and a dollar in cash gets four slices in the pie. So every day, as more contributions are made in time or ideas or facilities or supplies or whatever people are contributing, slices are accumulating every single day, just like bets are being placed on the table every single day. So for instance, time is a, pop is a popular one. You take someone's fair market salary, you should track cash compensation because if I'm paying you, you don't deserve equity. In fact, most of our jobs that we get are simply salaried positions. You work for a company, they pay you a salary, they don't give you equity. If I pay you in full your fair market salary, I don't owe you any equity because you're not taking any risk. But if you don't get paid, you're taking risk. So it's not paid, the unpaid portion of your salary is at risk and you get two slices. Get your grunt hourly resource rate, or GER. So assuming 2,000 hours in a year, if you get paid 50 an hour, that's 100 slices per hour. It means every hour that goes by, you're contributing 100 slices to that pie. If I pay you 10 an hour, you're only risking 40, which means you have 80 slices per hour. Money. If I invest cash, I have an unreimbursed expense. When the come money is spent, it's times four, four slices for the dollar, or whatever I put in. If it's a new piece of equipment that I purchased for the company, it's treated as cash, four slices. If it's less than a year old, I'd use the purchase price, which is two slices of non-cash. If it's older than a year, I use the book value, which is two slices. Everything has a fair market value. Everything can convert. If I have a good have a bunch of relationships, important relationships to the industry. Those will convert to cash as an unpaid commission. 
So I normally would pay a commission to someone who had relationships. If I have the cash, I pay them. If I don't pay them, I use slices. If I have a really great idea, ideas are really important to startups. If the idea has value, that idea could be sold to somebody else for a, a royalty or a license. Unpaid royalties are non-cash contributions. There's two, slice, two slices. But by supplies or equipment, it's treated as cash, four slices. So everything has a fair market value. Just ask yourself, if I was paying cash, how much would I pay? If you can pay it, pay it. If you can't pay it, convert it to slices. So here's an example. Here are some Ukrainian grunts hanging out, looking for, looking for work. One of them has an idea, and he builds a team. He hires a junior developer whose job it is to build a WordPress site. He's the founder, and then he gets his rich uncle to make some important contacts and put some cash in the company. So he brings in time and ideas and some equipment. The junior developer puts in just time, and the rich uncle puts in cash and relationships. So the first step is to take those contributions, the fair market value of those contributions, and convert them to slices. So now we know how many slices each person had. We know what bets they're making. We simply add them together and divide each person's share. So there's grunt number one share, number two's share, and number three share. So now our equity split looks like this. It's logical that the junior developer has less than the rich uncle because the rich uncle bankrolled this, put all the money up for this project. It's also logical that the founder has less than the rich uncle because the rich uncle put all the money up. He's not taking as much risk. So at this point in time, slicing pie has counted up the, the bets and allocated equity accordingly. If the company was to terminate the slicing pie agreement now, this is how equity would be allocated. Now let's add somebody. This is a new person. He's an important salesperson. He's gonna bring time and relationships to the table. So we have to take what he did and convert to slices. Now we're gonna pretend that no one else is doing any work this period, which isn't usually the case, but we're gonna pretend that. So you simply add his slices, his bets, into the total bets, and you divide each person's share again. So there's grunt number one, two, three, and four, gives us a new allocation. The salesperson now has 13% of the company, which is logical given that he's making important sales and bringing in some time. The founder and the uncle and the junior developer have all changed their equity share, which is logical because they have a bigger company now. If the rich uncle and the founder were not willing to adjust their shares in the company because they had a fixed split, the salesperson and the junior developer would have to fight about who got what. And the salesperson would ultimately not join the company because he wasn't being treated fairly. So as time goes on, this will adjust automatically to maintain fairness in the equity split. Now, when someone leaves the company, there may be an opportunity to recover their equity so you can give it to somebody else in the future. There are four reasons why someone can leave a company. The first reason is they can be fired for good reason. Being fired for good reason means you were doing something that was against the rules of the company. For instance, you stole from the company, or you uh, brought a gun to work, or you sexually harassed a coworker. Or the most common one is you weren't doing your job properly performance-based. And in slicing pie, it's warning, warning, fired. You give someone two warnings because you have to give them the opportunity to correct their behavior. If you don't give someone the opportunity to correct their behavior, you're essentially firing them for no good reason, which is box number B. No good reason means the company fires you for whatever reason they want. It's not related to your behavior or your choices. An employee deserves protection against someone against getting fired for no reason just as the company deserves protection against an employee who gets fired for good reason. You can also resign for good reason. Resigning for good reason implies that the company made just promises that it didn't keep. So for instance, the company might have said, we'll pay you in six months when we raise money, and they don't raise money, so that's good reason to quit. Or you might have been hired as the vice president of marketing, and they change your job to cleaning the toilets. That's not what you signed up for. It's a broken promise. It's a good reason to quit. Or the company might say, we're based in Ukraine. 
we're moving to New York City, so pack your bags. That's a good reason to quit because it's not what you signed up for. Resigning for no good reason is resigning for personal reasons, for whatever reason you want. So the person might say, I can't afford to work for free anymore, so I'm going to quit. Or I don't like working here anymore, so I'm going to quit. Or I don't believe in the vision of the company, so I'm going to quit. That's the employee making decisions that negatively impact the future of the company. So in situations A and D, the employee has made decisions that have a negative impact on the future of the company. The employee deserves some kind of consequence, and their consequences are they lose their slices for non-cash contributions, and they lose the multiplier for cash contributions. If you put $1,000 in, I gotta give you 1,000 back and we're even. It's painful to leave a company under these circumstances, as it should be. If you wanna keep your slices, don't get fired and don't quit. The company is protected against employees getting fired or quitting because the employee realizes there's a consequence attached to their behaviors. If it's the company's fault because the person resigned for good reason or was fired for no good reason, the person gets to keep their slices in the pie. And when it converts to equity, they'll convert along with everybody else. What this means is the company is gonna be out that piece of equity and it's painful for a company to lose an employee as it should be under these circumstances. If you wanna get slices back, don't fire people. So the employee has protection for their contribution that's made. In a typical fixed equity split, companies have a lot more power to fire someone and get their equity back for no reason. It's not fair and it doesn't apply to slicing by. So here's our team. We're gonna fire somebody. We're gonna, the junior developer isn't doing her job properly. We're gonna give her one warning. A few weeks go by, she's still not doing her job properly. We've talked to her again, second warning. Third warning, she's fired. Now all she did was put in non-cash contributions. So her slices simply get taken out of the pie because she's fired for good reason. And we recalculate everyone's shares. So here's number two share who's left, three and four. Now the pie looks like this. We can see that the rich uncle and everyone has a little bit more equity, but they're not necessarily happy because now they have to find a new developer. But the pie is properly adjusted to, to accommodate the fact that person left the company. If it was a fixed equity split, the company would have to renegotiate with that person and perhaps buy, other, buy their shares back at an unpopular price, making it not a good choice for most companies. So one of the things that happens a lot in startup companies is that the people who quit or get fired actually are the only ones who ever make any money because they get a buyout on their shares. Now, once the company has adequate cash, to start paying for their bills and their employees and their salaries, you would bake the pie or terminate the deal. That happens usually when the company reaches break even point or a series A investment. A series A investment implies that enough money is invested into the company to cover all the expenses and salaries in the foreseeable future. Break even implies that enough revenue is coming in to cover all the expenses and salaries. So here's an example. So let's go back to our time example. This person usually pays 50 an hour, um, but they're not getting paid anything, so they're putting 50 an hour at risk, which is 100 slices per hour. Now revenue comes into the company, the company can now afford to pay some part of that hourly rate, we'll call it 10 per hour, which means only 40 is being put at risk, which means the company, the guy is now contributing 80 slices per hour. As more revenue comes in, the company can afford to pay more money. And that reduces the risk the person's taking, which reduces the number of slices per hour they're contributing. So here's 30, 40, and 50. When the person's being paid in full for every hour they contribute, they're contributing no hours per, uh, slices per hour, and the pie naturally stops accumulating slices. At this point, the pie terminates, and equity is issued in the company. And if there's profits or proceeds coming in after that break-even point, Profits of the proceeds of a sale are split up among the founders according to their bets. This is exactly like in the blackjack example, where if we win, I get 25% and you get 75%. Our share of the winnings reflects our share of the bets. Now the other option is bringing in a series A investor, professional investor. So let's say we negotiate a 900,000 pre-money valuation. The slices in the pie have nothing to do with the valuation of the company. Hopefully you've built valuation through getting customers and revenues and things like that. 
So you'll negotiate your pre-money valuation. Let's say you raise a million. That means the post-money valuation is 1.9 million or 1,900,000 slides dollars. So now you've sold more than half the company. You use that money to pay salaries and pay your expenses and pay everybody off according to their, your, your needs. And now when the profits come in, you split it with your Series A investor. So what we get here is a model that's perfectly fair. It's rewarding actual contributions people make, not what people say they're gonna do, what they promise they're gonna do, or what we hope they're gonna do, what they actually do. It's providing ongoing motivation. As long as I contribute, I'm gonna maintain my slices in the pie. It accommodates team changes. I showed you how to add somebody and subtract somebody. It's flexible in the face of rapid change. The model automatically adjusts. We don't have to renegotiate or call an attorney every time. And we've gotten rid of the gators. No one's going to think that we're going to take advantage of them or they're going to take advantage of us. So there's two reasons that I found why someone would not want to use slicing pie. The first reason is that he or she does not get it. They don't understand how the model works and it just doesn't, it's not understandable. That's why I do talks like this and I have lots of resources available. My job in my life right now is to make sure that every person on the planet who's running a startup understands and appreciates the value of slicing pie. There's a slicing pie book that's available. There's a slicing pie handbook, which is an updated version. There's a European Union version of the book. The book is available in translations all over the world. I don't have um, Russian. I do have Polish is the closest thing I got. Um, but there's translations coming out all the time. There's software online that on my website at slicingpie.com that can help you track your contributions. Think about slicing pie software as tracking what you don't spend, whereas an accounting software might account what you do spend. So this helps you keep track of your slices. There's free spreadsheets, there's legal contracts, there's events that I have all over the world. I'm always available as much as I can to make sure people understand the model. Because once someone understands the model, and they understand how it works, it'll be obvious and logical to use slicing pie, whereas fixed equities but simply don't make any sense. The other situation where someone would not want to use slicing pie is that he, he or she does understand it, but agrees, but doesn't want to play fair. And this could be in the case of a, an angel investor who wants to get the line, the, the, most of the equity for themselves, or someone wants to take advantage of you. Personally, in my life, I want to avoid people who don't want to play fair, and I want to make sure people are treating me fairly and my teammates fairly. Um, but the two reasons are they don't understand it, in which case I'm here as a resource, or well, they do understand it and don't want to play fair. That's how the model works. I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Mike, I have a question. Like, uh, can you tell a bit about like how many companies do you use such approach? What's specific about them? Can you name some prominent examples? Can you see my head, my head now? Yeah, yeah, we see your head. Um, so the question is how many companies use slicing pie and some example of companies that use slicing pie. Right. It's impossible for me to track how many companies use slicing pie. Most people who read a book don't call the author of the book and say, hey, I used your book and it's working out great. That being said, I can tell you that the first version of it came out in 2020. I sold thousands of copies all over the world in nine different languages. I had thousands of users on my software package. I've had thousands of downloads of my software. In all that time, I haven't heard of a single failure because of slicing pie, not one. Lawyers estimate that, lawyers that I've talked to estimated 60 to 80% of their fixed equity payments we sometimes slow lose you. Maybe you close the microphone or something. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Let's continue. Um, so, uh, so what I know is that when people use slicing pie properly, their equity splits do not fail. There's been a number of companies that I know of that have gone on to raise Series A capital, and the way I track that is through people that emails. Sorry, sorry, we're we, we losing you again. Can you uh, can you check the mic or maybe to, to keep, take it a bit closer? I don't know. I don't know which part you missed. Uh, last one or two sentences. 
I, I can't track and name specifically the companies who use it because it's impossible for me to track, unfortunately. The companies that I do have on my software are, I, I can't divulge their names because they're. So, sorry. I'm not sure what the problem, but uh, on some level you, you're starting to mute. Uh, let's, uh, let's do something with that. I don't know. Um, other questions? Um, uh, I have a question. Hello? Yes, I hear you. Uh, yeah, um, my question is uh, why you in your model evaluate uh, money contribution uh, twice more than uh, people? Because uh, if you put, for example, million dollars on the table, it doesn't make a rocket fly. It make um, like uh, people contribution to finish startup project, whatever. So the question is, why do I weight cash higher than non-cash? Yes. And the reason is because when you have cash in the bank, in your bank account, that's post-tax dollars. So when I earn cash and I take it home, there's been employment taxes taken out of it. There's been an income taxes taken out of it. There's been uh, sales tax taken out of it. So I actually have to work longer to earn the same amount of money that I could save. So it accounts for sales tax and it accounts for taxes. It also aligns the investor up. So when I put, I put that million bucks in the company, I want you to think twice before you spend it. Back in the dot-com bubble days, when we raised billions of dollars through IPOs, we were going on vacations and buying ping pong balls and video games and having a good time. I want in people to think twice before they spend the money so we weight cash higher than non-cash. So it accounts for the taxes, the scarcity, and alignment for the manager team. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, another question. Uh, like we have many lawyers here, so uh, they may be interested about like uh, where do you see the legal framework of that really working? In which countries? With, like, are there any jurisdictions where it's easier to do or harder? What can you say about that? So the legal issues are different all over the world. Some countries have more oppressive laws than others. What I know for sure is that no matter where you are in the world, slicing pie is still fair. So if your legal rules push you towards an unfair model, you need to find a way to make sure that slicing pie will work. Now, there's a number of different ways to implement slicing pie given different legal environments. So in some cases, you can actually allocate shares on an ongoing basis. In other cases, like in the United States, we use what's called a restricted share, which means you can make an allocation to somebody, but use a vesting agreement to vest those shares. And slicing pie is the vesting agreement. In other cases, you can issue, issue people equal shares in the company, and then at termination of the pie, you would buy down shares from the company, but back, you buy shares back from individuals to match slicing pie. So there wouldn't be an income tax trigger. In some countries, you issue shares to founders and they trade shares among themselves to readjust for slicing pie. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, depending on the legal environment you're in. One thing I do very often is that if you have an attorney who's curious about slicing pie or you want to help them implement slicing pie, I'll do free phone calls with them and help them learn the model and pick the solution that works best for them. As long as they don't charge you, I won't charge them. Um, so in many countries, I have attorneys that are familiar with slicing pie and have created contracts. What's really important to remember about slicing pie is that it's used during the bootstrap phase, the, when there's ina inadequate cash. And there's typically no valuation on the company or zero valuation. So taxes are less of an issue during that period because there's no, there's no cash value. It's not until your company has a cash value at Series A investment or uh, your break even when the shares can actually start having a real value. So usually a zero sum uh, transaction in the early days. But uh, the key point is there's a dumb number of different ways to implement that all work. And uh, your country, uh, if you have an attorney in your country, I can help them figure out what the best one for, for, for you is. Thank you. Кто-то хочет по юридической теме спросить что-то? 
Okay, I got one trick, like trick question from my colleague. So like we're uh, using it in a IT company, and uh, he asked me like, uh, it seems like I can take uh, all of my salary in cash and then get it back as uh, cash, uh, you know, uh, intake, you know, and get it uh, like twice more slices for that. Do you understand? Yes. So you're basically tricking the pie into thinking you have more slices. So ideally the management team would prevent that from happening. But if you get paid in cash and then turn around and put the cash back into the company, all you're doing is incurring more taxes on that cash and using you're consuming the cash up in, in a ridiculous way. So th there's no real benefit to doing that. If someone's gaming the system to get more slices inappropriately, that could be grounds for termination for cause. So if a manager and manager saw that happening, first the manager managing the pie should not let that happen. Um, you always want to use the most efficient tool. Um, but if it is happening inadvertently, you would give someone a warning and the warning and fire, then they would lose their slices. Uh, if the company had no cash to pay, then there would be no cash payments out. But you can't take cash from the company and then put it back on top of the company. It's not appropriate. Uh, I wonder if I missed, uh, but uh, was there any multiplier for like investments that are both non cash and non cash? Uh, like uh, the example was given about the fund and uh, like etc. And uh, was there any multiplier? How does it come? You, you, you have you heard it? Could you repeat the question closer to the microphone? Uh, yes, yeah, so the question was about which multiplier do you put on the investments that are between cash and non-cash, like a truck? So the investments that are in between, you make a de determination if they're cash or non-cash. So for instance, a truck, if I bought the truck for the company, that's cash out of my pocket to buy the truck. That's the if I owned the, company, the, the truck before the company started and I had it sitting in my backyard, I it at non-cash, either the purchase value for the year old, uh, so uh, we, we again we have uh, haven't heard some of that. Was it about that uh, you take the market value and put the two multiplier by two or or, or four? Well, so you want to determine if, it, if, it, if cash was required to, to produce the contribution. So if I bought a truck for the company and paid cash, that's cash out of pocket. If the used car that I owned before, that's not cash. Yeah, let's try. It might have to fit for you to Use your microphone while I'm talking. So is that better? If it's if you, if you bought the truck for the company, that's cash out of pocket. If you own the truck previously and sitting in your backyard to use truck, that's a non-cash contribution. If you had some supplies from a previous business, an old laptop, for instance, the laptop's fair market value would go in as non-cash. If you bought the laptop for the company specifically, that's 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 a cash contribution. So you determine with his actual cash out of pocket. Okay, so it's being multiplied by two, right? If it's non-cash, it's multiplied by two. If it's cash out of pocket, it's multiplied by four. How would you build um, an ADA estimation process in such cases? For example, we need to understand how many plus uh, count of the estimation for that. Okay, so the question is, how do you estimate an idea, right? That's a good question. Thanks for asking. Ideas are important, but most of the ideas have very low values. And the way to tell is if that the fair market value for an idea is a license contract. So if you have an idea for um, a, a new type of fishing tackle box, you can license it to a manufacturer of fishing tackle boxes, or you can start your own fishing tackle box manufacturing company. Now, when I was in charge of marketing for a fishing tackle box manufacturer, I had inventors coming to me all the time 
wanting to sell their ideas to me. I paid a 2% royalty on those ideas. So the fair market value for a fishing tackle box in the United States is a 2% royalty on revenues. If you can't sell your idea to somebody, it probably doesn't have a lot of value. Um, so you would, uh, you would determine what the logical license price would be, and you'd either pay the license fee in cash or you'd allocate slices. And a license would typically have an advance and an ongoing royalty on revenues. Why that's really important is, if you allocate a chunk of equity up front for an idea, and you pivot away from that idea, you will have paid for an idea in slices that didn't have an impact on the company. By using a royalty, only when that idea produces revenues and value for the company is it rewarded with equity. Does that make sense? That yeah, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Mike, hello. Do you hear hello. me? Yes. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, I wanted to add uh, something about my uh, idea talk. And the first question is uh, how to evaluate networking. As you said, it's non, uh, non money. Um, non money resource and talking about ideas like um, I imagine that evaluating ideas they, that can only impact on product uh, make people like creating something that can be monetized but not uh, really caring about the product its quality it's like you know some kind of details that really matters but can be really monetized if you, if you understand what I'm talking about, yeah, and networking, how, how can you evaluate that? So, so there's two questions. How do I account for networking? Yep. The other is how do I account for ideas that may not be directly attributable to revenue? Yeah, something like that, yes. So you want to think about this in terms of if I was paying for this, what would I pay? If I hired you to work for me, I would expect that for your annual salary, you would come up with great ideas on the job all the time. It's your job to have awesome ideas. If you're our vice president of marketing, it's your job to have awesome marketing ideas and you pay, get paid a salary for that. If, it's your, if you're in an engineering department, it's your job to come up with great new engineering ideas. In a regular company, your boss doesn't pay you per idea. They pay you your salary. In the engineering department, they don't pay you per idea. They pay you for your, your salary. So it's your job on the job to have good ideas. Now, if you're out networking, that, that's time spent on the job. So all those things are, are based on your experience, your salary level, based on your experience and your education. Somebody that has a big, big network gets paid more than someone who has a small network. With a network specifically, if I'm able to monetize that network, I either raise, I, I get new vendor relationships, sales contracts, investors, all those things have a fair market way of compensation. So if I sell something into my network, I would get a commission. If I raise money from my network, I get a finder's fee. If I secured a vendor relationship, I might get a finder's fee for that. Or if I hire a new employee, there might be a bonus for hiring a new employee. So you always look at the relationship in terms of if I was paying for it, what would I pay? In most cases, it's simply your job to do a good job and your relationship, your network, and your ideas are all part of what you're doing and part of your job. In which case, your unpaid salary would be going to slices. One thing that happens a lot is that we think because it's a startup, there's some kind of magic happening that our network is worth more than it is to us or our ideas are worth more than something else. It's only worth what someone's willing to pay for it. So if I, if I, if I think I'm worth a million dollars a year, but I can't find anybody to pay me a million dollars a year, I'm only worth my fair market salary. I get paid my salary. And as long as I have good ideas and keep productive, I'll keep my job, maybe get a raise or a bonus. If I don't have good ideas, I'll lose my job. It totally makes sense. Sense. Thank you for the answer. And uh, related question, talking about ideas. Yeah, I, I definitely get it that uh, you are. It's your duty to uh, get your work done and do it uh, in the best way possible. Uh, but uh, how about like? Um, um, I'm trying to. Uh, okay, you have, a, for example, a salesperson, and uh, he or she has a, um, some number of shares, but uh, uh, your employee is with you, for example, for one year, and uh, he upgraded his skills. So, uh, for example, he uh, develops a lot, and now he thinks that he costs more on, on the market. So. Uh, as is a dynamic system, is it acceptable for you to like define more shares if a person 
uh, comes to you and tells you that uh, now um, uh, my value is higher on the market and I want more shares for that. I'm more experienced and I think uh, that I contribute more to, to the start. So two things I want to make sure it's very clear. The first one is he wouldn't have any shares because you haven't, you haven't allocated shares yet, so he'd have slices. The second thing is, if a salesperson comes on board and starts making sales and then starts demanding more compensation, that's a, just a business discussion you have with them or her. So you always ask yourself, if I was going to pay you, would I be willing to pay you more? If the answer is yes, then you can have a discussion about salary and commission. If the answer is no, then you would split part ways, in which case that person is leaving for their own purposes. So they, they would lose their slices in the pie if they're, if they're quitting for no good reason. So you're always, you always have the discussion as if you have the cash. So the, what's nice about slicing pie is you always run your company as if it was a company who had cash and you're always making rational decisions with the cash. So if you were negotiating a salary with a salesperson, you negotiate that salary and you put it in place for that person. And if you could pay it, you'd pay it. If you couldn't, you'd use slices. If that person wanted to raise later on, you'd have that discussion again about base salary and commission. If that seemed logical to you because they're doing such a great job, you'd give them that raise just like you would a normal employee. If it didn't seem logical, you'd say no to them. At that point, they can choose to stay on board with their old salary or they can choose to leave for their own reasons and lose slices. So there's always incentives and logical negotiations going on at every point in the, in the company. If you're talking about equity shares and a fixed equity split, then you're always taking equity out of someone else's pocket and putting it in somebody else's. So it's always this argument. The slicing pie, you just make logical decisions about whether or not you pay that person cash if you have the cash. And if you don't have the cash, you simply use slices. So slices creates a currency by which you can make logical decisions. Got it. Thank you. Uh, you just mentioned the currencies, and uh, I was thinking about like current trend of uh, blockchain and tokenization of everything and organizations. Have you, do, do you, have you, do you have any ideas in this field, any development of such approach in the crypto space? Good question. Thanks for asking. There, there are Bitcoin, bit, uh, blockchain versions of slicing pie software. Um, it's, it's not perfected yet. It's kind of slow and it's sure you're aware the transaction speed is pretty slow. A slice represents a at-risk contribution. It has no inherent value. It has no tradable value. It's only worth something in the future relative to other slices. So if there's five slices in the pie and I have three of them, I own three-fifths of the company. If there's a million slices in the pie and I have 100 of them, I own a certain percentage of the company if it breaks even. So a slice does create this currency that you can actually use for all kinds of things, but it simply, pay, it simply is a marker for what you didn't pay for that item, not what you did pay for it or in the actual value. So in a blockchain scenario, um, you could certainly turn use a, use blockchain to issue slices to people um, and, re, and recover them if you have to. Um, in the short term, I think it's, it's a, usually companies are more tight knit, and that level of trust is not required. That, but as the companies expand and use slices for more things, then certainly a bit a, a blockchain version of slicing pie would be a very logical thing to crowdsource, crowdfund things or crowdsource contributions. I mean, it does give you a lot of possibilities in terms of having, you know, hundreds of participants to startup companies, in which case blockchain would be logical. Thank you. Yes. Uh, the question is regarding uh, the legal frameworks. Uh, is there any kind of legal implication in some well known stuff like safe uh, by can you repeat the question closer to the microphone? Yeah, 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 I'll repeat. So the question was, uh, does slicing the pie have some integration with already existing practices, like, for example, SAFE in the like venture capital uh, agreement for future equity? Do you now have like already existing frameworks? Yes. So think of slicing pie as a financing tool. The financing tool that startups use is not paying for stuff. So another financing tool will be a loan. Another financing tool will be a convertible note. Another financing tool will be a direct equity investment. 
So it's just one of many financing tools. And it's a way to finance, finance and, and a, uh, unknown contributions. So one of the things that you've got to keep in mind is when you finance a startup company using a mix of tools that are a mix of fixed and non-fixed uh, contributions, you create problems. So if I sold you 1,000 shares for $1,000, I'm implying a dollar per share. Your equity, if I, if I sold you 10% for $1,000, then your exposure is limited to $2,000. Well, my exposure could be unlimited as I continue to contribute. So it cre creates a, a problem with the dynamic of fixed equity split. So you always want to use, uh, if, if you don't have adequate cash, then a safe agreement would be something you would want to use or convertible note until you had adequate cash. So there's no, there's no direct relationship between the two deals. Just know they're different, they're different types of investments. Um, there's a tool called a slicing pie loan where I would borrow money from someone and make regular payments on it. If I skipped a payment, it would convert to slices. So it's all, they're all just different financing tools. But slicing pie is its own financing tools. And you know, you, you wouldn't change the terms of slicing pie for different participants. You just use a different financing tool. Does that, does that answer your question? It seems like all the questions uh, are answered. Thank you so much for such a productive and insightful session. Uh, We'll definitely look more into that. You're welcome. And if you have any questions or you want a copy of the Slicing by Handbook, please send me an email. Remember, two reasons not to use it. Either you don't understand it or you don't play fair. So um, if you don't understand it, please reach out to me and I'm happy to help you as much as I possibly can. Okay, thanks. Peace. Bye-bye.